Thank you, Chairperson. And thank you for the invitation to give this lecture on the topic of neurogenetics. So I hope by the end of this talk, you will be able to identify the main disorders of neurogenetics seen in our clinics and um, be able to look uh, understand the clinical presentation of these disorders. And I hope to give an overview of the currently used diagnostic tests for neurogenetics as well as uh, in the latter part of the talk, go into the research based outputs with regards to neurogenetics. So inherited neurological diseases uh, are a rare disease category, but of course um, there is a ripple effect from uh, even these rare disorders uh, that fall upon not only the patient, but their families and society in general. So um, getting a definitive diagnosis with the use of genetic testing gives a, a concrete idea to the patient with regards to what is the disease the patient has and thereby up the prognosis and the clinical course the pa uh, patient will have in the future. Also, it's possible to do predictive testings of family members, uh, both uh, vertical inheritance and horizontal inheritance uh, can be studied with the use of genetic uh, testing methods and thereby give a predictive uh, test uh, results for those family members. Um, so I went into the past eight years of uh, tests done and patients seen in the human genetics unit and approximately 100 patients were seen which could be categorized under the purview of uh, neurogenetic disorders. Many of these came from the National Hospital and Lady Ridgeway Hospital, so pediatric and adult neurogenetic conditions. And of course, we have an, uh, de maintained detailed records with regards to the conditions that we encountered. So in, with regard to the adult uh, diseases, neurogenetic diseases, uh, many were falling into the categories of spinocerebellar ataxias, and Huntington disease. From the pediatric neurogenetic disease categories, we saw many muscular dystrophies, spinal muscular atrophies, and myotonic dystrophies. In addition, of course, there are rare neurogenetic disorders, rare disorders themselves. These individual cases composed another significant proportion of those cases seen within the clinic. So according to what disease category these cases fall into, the clinical presentation, et cetera, we can give a targeted genetic test, uh, such as for Huntington disease, of course, Huntington gene uh, is a targeted gene test. And with regards to uh, disease groups, such as spinal cerebral ataxia, which is a hereditary ataxia group, there is several subtypes of SCA or spinocerebellar ataxias, approximately 40. So in those cases, we can go with uh, genetic tests such as MLPO, multiplex ligation probe amplification to target the multiple genes responsible for that disease category. In other uh, diseases where the clinical manifestations or the clinical syndrome is not clear, or the targeted gene test is very rare and therefore individual testing is not a viable option. Uh, clinical exome sequencing is also a very important uh, testing method available uh, where we can not only identify known diseases, but we have the opportunity to even go into uh, novel disease that cause neurogenetic conditions. and. Uh, novel variant identification, of course, is also a possibility. So going into the main categories of disease presentation, in the adult neurogenetic uh, uh, disease category, Huntington's disease is quite uh, commonly encountered. And as I said before, this is due to the variance in Huntington gene, and it's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. Many of the symptoms and signs associated with it uh, are quite well known, but to go into it briefly, this is adult onset neurogenetic disease. Uh, 
So uh, patients usually present from the third decade onwards with varying uh, neurological symptoms and signs, including personality changes, impaired judgment, motor signs, such as unsteady gait, involuntary movement, and speech, slurred speech, difficulty in swallowing, which results in significant weight loss. The other um, largely seen category of adult neurogenetic conditions is the spinocerebellar ataxia disease group. This is a group of hereditary ataxia. So there's several subtypes of SCA or spinocerebral ataxia. And in order of their identification, they have been named SCA1 to SCA40 at present. So there's 40 subtypes. And what's interesting to note is that there's individual gene mutations with the, the same clinical presentation. So different genes resulting in a similar ataxia, hereditary ataxia phenotype. And um, what's also interesting to note that only about 40% of these um, SCA subtypes actually have a known genetic cause. So the other uh, SCA subtypes, there is still to be further research prospects to be done to actually locate the gene that is responsible for that phenotype of hereditary ataxias. Uh, going uh, to the prevalence of worldwide prevalence of the SCA subtypes, it's SCA 1, 2, and 3, as well as SCA 6, that is the most prevalent worldwide. Here, um, the phenotype is based on a cerebellar as well as spinal cord uh, disease uh, affection. So there is ataxia dysarthria, as well as vision and, and involuntary eye movements. Uh, which are cerebellar signs, as well as uh, some spinal cord associated features are also seen. So both these Huntington disease and spinal cerebellar ataxias are ha having an autosomal dominant inheritance, where the affected uh, parent has a 50% chance of transmitting it, uh, the variant to the subsequent generation. What's also interesting to note is that both these diseases are triplet repeat diseases. So uh, triplet repeat is three base pairs, mostly CAG or CAG repeats. And what happens is in meiosis, the, uh, because these repeats have increased, they further and are an unstable. In a meiosis, they're further um, uh, increasing in size and therefore um, the variant uh, size is greater in the subsequent generation. Because of this, we have what is known as anticipation, where um, the onset of disease of the uh, child is earlier than that seen in the parent. So for instance, in spinocerebral ataxia, if the parent had the onset of uh, ataxia and disease uh, within the fifth or sixth gen uh, decade, the child will uh, manifest if they are affected with the variant within the fourth to fifth decade. And what's also uh, interesting with regards to these adult onset neurogenetic diseases is that the children see their parents being affected with the disease and yet they remain asymptomatic for a significant proportion of their adult life. So the genetic concept of pre-symptomatic testing comes into play in these children or um, uh, the second generation. So I'll go into that when we speak of the case discussion, uh, but for now I will go to the pediatric neurogenetic di disorders that we see. And the main disorder that we actually see is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which has a very um, well-known clinical manifestation symptoms and signs, which include uh, progressive muscular atrophies or pseudo hypertrophy of skeletal muscles, as well as uh, gross motor uh, milestones delays, such as the ability to sit, stand, or walk. And there is also the sign of waddling gait with to walking and the Gower's manure, which is uh, quite known, well known. In addition, uh, cardiac muscles can be also affected with cardiomyopathy as a, a sign. So DMD or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a variance in the Duchenne uh, dystrophin gene is inherited in a X-linked recessive manner. 
And uh, interestingly, many people do not have a family history uh, when they uh, present. And uh, Becker's muscular dystrophy is a other subtype of Duchenne's, which is a milder form of the muscular dystrophy, which is also caused by variants in the same dystrophin gene. So when we look at the X-linked recessive inheritance that is associated with Duchenne's and Becker's, um, the parents, if the, the carrier is a female or the mother, then she is asymptomatic and she is able to give the variants to both a male and female offspring. Of course, the male will manifest because he carries only a single X chromosome, while the female will also subsequently be a carrier. Um, but if the male is affected and is transmitting the variant, he will only be giving it to the uh, next generation, the daughters. So there, those uh, daughters will be asymptomatic carriers of the disease. So when we think uh, talk about the appropriate genetic test, um, having a, cl a clinical description, a detailed clinical description of the symptoms and signs will give us an indication of exactly what test to choose with regards to each and every neurogenetic condition that is presenting to the clinics. For instance, Huntington's and SCA, as well as Duchenne's, have a very a characteristic clinical manifestation. So in those instances, a targeted gene approach is possible. Um, as I said before, uh, SCA uh, is a disease with various subtypes. So we also have to have understanding of what is the most prevalent subtypes, which I said was SCA1, 2, 3, and 6. So we target those subtypes initially in our genetic test. So the uh, knowledge on the clinical description and the relative frequency of the prevalence of disease subtypes is important in choosing a genetic test. And of course, um, we also ca consider test cost availability and time required for analysis. So a targeted gene uh, analysis will take a few weeks, whereas if the clinical description is not syndromic and is a bit more widespread, we might go for exome. And in such an instance, uh, of course, the analysis and subsequent um, uh, clinical report will take a few months time. So there is differences in the time required for analysis as well as the uh, availab availability and cost. Uh, going into exome sequencing, when the phenotype of the neurogenetic condition is not uh, clear cut, we would go for something which looks at the, all the exons in all the genes of the human. So the 20,000 genes will be screened in an exome study. And worldwide, the possibility of coming up with a diagnostic variant that is uh, actually causing the disease phenotype is estimated at around 30%. So this diagnostic um, rate of 30% actually increases. It has been shown if we keep the exome data and reanalyze it uh, one to two years afterwards, we can actually increase our diagnostic yield to another 10 to 20%. So if total of 50% diagnostic yield is possible in such an instance. And this is because um, with rare diseases, rare neurological diseases, the functional studies, the scientific outputs, the research outputs increases on a day-to-day -day basis. So within a year, what was previously noticed, not noticed as a possible disease causing gene might pop up as a uh, disease, uh, as a gene that has uh, higher likelihood of being the causative gene for that patient. Um, genome sequencing is a much costlier effort. And actually, worldwide, the cost to uh, output or diagnostic output is yet not um, uh, viable. Uh, so there is an increase in approximately 5% of diagnosis worldwide. So such an increase compared to the cost that it is compared to exome sequencing is quite high. So uh, we are actually on worldwide levels in saying that the exome is the most um, useful method in uh, sequencing and testing for diseases that do not have a clear cut clinical phenotype or syndrome that we can test directly for the gene. Of course, other research uh, techniques are used 
for various other uh, clinical materials such as mRNA sequencing, which can be done from cells taken from skin, muscle, or blood. And these are, of course, research-based outputs with regards to um, neurogenic disorders. There is a recent paper on uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, where muscular biopsies have shown results uh, by RNA sequencing and a lot of uh, new syndromes were diagnosed. So this is a research-based output that is possible to be done in the future. So um, focused research into the more highly prevalent disease categories such as ataxias and Huntington's uh, as well as spinal muscular atrophy has been done by the clinic. Also, there have been several research on case-based studies that showed unique characteristics with regard to their neurogenetic manifestations. So um, one of the uh, main problems that we see with research in these neurogenetic conditions that the fact that they're um, rare is a great limitation. So even if we do exome study and find a variant um, in a novel disease gene, to actually conclude on whether it's pathogenic or if it's a variant of uncertain significance or whether it's benign is a bit difficult when you have a single case with uh, these novel variants in novel disease genes. So one of the best options out there is of course data sharing and finding a second family with variants in the same gene um, with a similar phenotype. And so that is the fastest way to take a candidate discovery to confirmation and publication. And there's several platforms out there. They're freely available platforms. So once exome sequencing data is made available, we can share the phenotype as well as the variants on these platforms and other researchers across the globe can also see and if they have a similar variant or gene with the variant or a phenotype that overlaps our variants and phenotypes, they can uh, contact us and establish a collaboration. So some of the uh, main data sharing methods is Gene Matcher and other platforms are such as my Matchbox and my Gene 2 are also available. So um, the final, of course, outcome or the hope for many patients is a possible therapeutic option. So this is a, a flow diagram of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and the possible therapeutics that are present at, uh, at uh, today. So we have primary therapies and secondary therapies. Primary therapies are those that can actually address the variant and reverse the genetic uh, mutation. So those are shown here in the black um, arrows. Here we can do genome editing, exon skipping, cell therapies, etc. And then downstream, we see a lot of uh, other therapies that are actually uh, focusing on the mole downstream molecular pathogenesis of the disease. So for instance, there, uh, because of the variant in the dystrophing gene, uh, various cellular components can be affected, such as mitochondria, signaling pathways, and inflammatory pathways, et cetera. So secondary therapeutics actually focus on addressing and relieving those uh, secondary pathologies by um, using therapeutics. So understanding not only the variant, but the not only the genotype, uh, the genotype phenotype correlation is also important and also downstream the molecular pathogenesis of disease caused by the gene variant is also very important to understand with regards to therapeutic options. So uh, for the future, of course, uh, the continued collaboration between clinicians is, of course, quite important um, to provide uh, tailor-made genetic services to patients with hereditary neurological diseases. And of course, research-based findings with regards to the Sri Lankan population and performing genetic counseling is another output we hope to focus on. Uh, thank you. Um, there is a case-based discussion that I hope to go in uh, later on, um, but just to give you an idea, this is a pedigree that was published, uh, and we have several uh, patients shown, uh, 
So the arrows are those that are known as probands or the ones who actually came for consultation with us. So one of these, the most left-hand side pa a patient indicated with a black square is a 35-year-old male that came uh, for a consultation with the onset of the ataxia and dysarthria. His father had a similar clinical manifestation. So um, we're, we will go through uh, several questions that he had uh, with regards to his disease and the possibility of the future of his children. So um, yeah, so that is the case that I hope to discuss later in the day. Thank you.